Hi, I'm KS Garner, and you're listening to the Solo Nerdwork Podcast. Today, I'll be speaking with the creator, writer, and self-publisher of the Rapture Burgers graphic novel series, Chris Hill, here to promote the novel's first volume on Kickstarter. Welcome, Chris. Hi, thank you for having me. Well, thank you for joining us. But uh, outside of my introduction, who is Chris Hill in his own words? Ah, uh, that's a lot of, that's a, that's a heavy question. Uh, well, so primarily uh, I work in tech as an engineer, but outside of that, um, I have been working on um, sort of independent publishing and comics. Uh, I, I guess you could say I officially started publishing them around 2014 or 2015. Uh, I also ferment miso at home and I study Japanese swords uh, and yeah, a lot of strange hobbies outside of that too. So we'll, we'll keep it to that. Okay, so what is Rapture Burgers about? Uh, Rapture Burgers is about a high school student who wakes up one day and decides to conquer the world. Uh, there's a little bit more to it around his status at school and his motivations, but at its core, it's about sort of a bumbling idiot trying to conquer the world. Okay, so can you maybe just elaborate a little bit more on your creative process? So for, I guess, for Rapture Burgers as a whole, or maybe just this first volume, possibly just from a thought in your head to working it out as a complete work, maybe just outlining it, in, I guess, the whole thing, and then starting with the first one to finding your collaborators. And then now, possibly, it may be months later, years later, whatever it may be, to now promoting it on Kickstarter. Uh, yeah, so this originally started um, as a notepad document on my PC, and it was just the ending of a story that I had, and I had no idea what the beginning or the middle were, but I knew how it ended. And from there, over years, I started to develop it a little more, but that happened to coincide with um, my uh, friend and co-writer Adam and I wanted to make a web comic. Uh, we wanted to make like a four panel comedy web comic, like gun, um, man, I forget the name of some of those old ones. I, I don't even know if they're still around, but obviously Penny Arcade was very, is still very big. Um, and there are a number of uh, indie sort of web comics that got really big, like Hark of Agron and uh, Casey Green's works. So we were very inspired by that and also by Scott Pilgrim a little bit um, to go ahead and make our own little web comic and put it up. And, you know, that turned into a brainstorming session where we, we decided to use a little bit of an aspect of my real life, which is that there was a running gag that I was going to conquer the world one day. Um, and, you know, we, we from there base the characters on us. And in some cases, like with Camille, the main character decided he should look nothing like me and that he should a little bit be his own person. But there are elements of Camille that are absolutely taken from me in high school, um, being a little bit of, of manic uh, megalomaniac, I guess you could say. And which is a little weird, a little bit of a weird thing to be. Um, but um, from from that, uh, we worked together with one of my siblings to uh, draw like character designs. And then we actually did draw uh, a handful of pages, but it took like two years to get them done. And they were very rough. The writing wasn't very good, um, but we got we started to get pretty decent at writing little punchlines at the end of every page. And so we took that. And um, around 2012 or 2013, um, I happened to go to an event here in L.A. that was effectively speed dating for an artist. It was the artists were set up at tables and writers would come through and sit down at the table, pitch their idea to the artist, look at the portfolio and then maybe agree on working together. And I was able to find uh, the original artist of the uh, Rapture Burgers graphic novel series, uh, Mimi Alves, uh, through that process. And we worked together for like six years, um, just making those three volumes. And, you know, I got them printed and I exhibited at conventions around LA. And um, 
you, exhibit at conventions was a good learning experience uh, because I think most of us, if we start out there, think, well, I'm going to put a bunch of books on the table and sit there and people will come and look at them. Uh, and that's not at all how it works. Like I had to stand up in carnival bark at people and ask them, do you like world domination? And physically hand them a book to make them flip through it. And we did decently. Like we, we were able to sell some books and get people to come back, you know, the next year. Uh, and, you know, so after doing that for years, I uh, hooked up with an, an American animation studio uh, and was working on a pilot for Rapture Burgers that we wanted to pitch. And, um, you know, I spent a couple of years working with them and it didn't quite go the way I wanted. The, the, the style was okay, but the direction that we went with, what elements do we show in a pilot? How is it written? They just didn't quite work out. And so eventually I decided what I should do and what I would like to do is a retelling from the ground up, completely rewritten with all the knowledge and experience from doing the first one. And with now knowing the entire story in my head, rather than like, well, we're going to write it as we go a little bit. And um, so that sort of led to me meeting Pepper, uh, the, the artist I'm currently working with, who um, is based out of Japan and has done manga work professionally in the past. And uh, I've been working with him for about two years or so, developing a pipeline and going through redesigning characters, um, getting background work done. And uh, finally, we got it to a point where I felt I can show this to people and I can you know, put it out there and ask, are you willing to help me with this? Because I've self-funded this this entire time um, and just continued to create it. And a little bit of um, I'm going to make it whether you like it or not way, <laughs> but also in hopes that there are people that it resonates with. And, you know, we're much better at describing what the story is and the scope of it now. Um, and so, you know, that obviously that led to creating this Kickstarter that I'm, I'm now advertising and, and trying to get backers for. So how difficult was the world building for Rapture Burgers? Even, I mean, if even was. So like, how did you manage to create a world that is totally your own and integrate your influences in it, but maintain that Rapture Burgers is yours and in your world and not someone else's? Yeah, that is actually a very challenging part of world building because, um, you know, it's very common to say this is a story that's like X mixed with Y and therefore you get this. And um, but it's also very easy, especially as a young amateur writer to say, for example, I like Scott Pilgrim. I want to make something like like Scott Pilgrim and it's going to have the same tone and feel to it. But that's not yours. You're borrowing from Brian Lee O'Malley in that case. And uh, it took a uh, honestly, it took a while. Uh, when we first started writing the original graphic novel uh, for Rapture Burgers, um, we didn't have a lot of world building. Uh, we knew that Camille was going to try to take over the world and that um, the first volume was mostly going to be about dealing with the breakup with his ex-girlfriend and him desperately trying to win her back while also sort of realizing and leaning into this idea that, you know what, I'm going to conquer the world. This is, this is what I'm going to do. And um, so I was saying earlier, originally I, I had written in a notepad file, the ending of a story. Well, at a certain point I started to merge Rapture Burgers in that story. And I mean, the Rapture Burgers, that was just a silly comedy concept. And I started to think more about, the characters as people and the world they live in and how do I build upon that? And um, for example, the post-apocalypse aspect of it, um, Adventure Time was really big back then. And uh, so the decision to do post-apocalypse was really about thinking this character, how is it possible for him to do something this big and crazy? Because we didn't want to make a story that was like, an episodic comedy where nothing ever changes and Camille can never possibly exceed, succeed. 
Um, and, and so thinking about like, what kind of world is it for this story, for him to have a chance to even tease the idea that he could. And so it was, okay, well, uh, the world has mostly been destroyed, but what about how was it destroyed? Who are, um, like, is there a government in place? What kind of factions are there involved in all of this? Where does he live if it's a post-apocalypse? What's the social structure around him where he lives? What's his history with the post-apocalypse and it happening? And so it, it almost naturally came about because I had to start asking those questions if I wanted this to be a real story and not just a pointless, sort of aimless, silly comedy. Uh, and from there, I, I took inspiration from various classic sci-fi novels that I was that I'm into because I like sci-fi a lot. Um, I really enjoy the concept of space elevators, and uh, like for example, Arthur C. Clarke's Fountains of Paradise uh, is a little bit of a dry book, but it is about trying to build a space elevator and all the things around it. And like the foundation novels from Asimov um, are, you know, they're, they're more of ideas books, a lot of those, where it was, let's take this scientific concept and expound upon it just, and like the characters were never that great. Um, but the, the reading those sorts of things a little bit helps you with thinking about like world building and what elements should you include. And um <laughs> Sorry about that. My my dog is uh, very excited right now. It's fine. Um, so, but um, uh, anyway, yeah. So the more I thought about telling Camille's story and connecting it to the ending that I had in mind, the more I fleshed out what the world was around him. And I think very logically. So um, for me, not that I'm the kind of person who nitpicks plot holes, but I need at least that two layers of validation for me to accept um, a, su a suspension of disbelief. So, you know, if you tell me that it's a futuristic setting and there are laser guns, I don't need a detailed explanation of how the laser guns work. I'll accept it. But I am, um, I do feel pretty strongly about if it's intended to be sort of serious sci fi or fantasy, making a set of rules for the world and like following them. And um, so that feeling for me turned into, I feel very strongly about establishing a world that makes sense for the story that I'm trying to tell and not just, I don't know, we hand wave it. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Don't look behind the curtain. Uh, so yeah, I, it's, I, I will say that I spent a lot of time writing very, very long Google documents that were just extended explanations about like, the space elevators, who built them, when they were built, why they were built, uh, how long it took to build them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And like, oh, well, you know, it's post-apocalypse. Well, what caused it? Uh, let's talk about the politics of the world uh, that caused all this. And it's not to say that everybody needs to do that, but that's the kind of, that's the way I think about it. Well, it's probably going to come up at some point. At some point down the line, you know, a fan may ask that, when they come up to you, they read it and they want to know question, uh, have, have questions about it, or you might be doing a panel somewhere down the line. Someone right. is definitely going to ask, like, how did this come about? So you'll already have it. It's good to already just have it set, set aside that way. Yeah, and I would say for storytelling, um, I think sometimes now foreshadowing is underappreciated. And um being able to foreshadow requires you to know what's going to happen and what the world is before you start to write it. Um, or else you're scrambling 30 chapters later and asking like, wait, what did I say back then? What did I d d depict? Crap. I don't remember that. Mm -hmm. um, and I got burned by that a little bit because, uh, you know, writing by the seat of your pants. And so especially this, this iteration that we're doing now, I did a lot of pre-planning, uh, a lot of like checking dates and and setting details um, that, and it also allowed me this time. Um, so the the original graphic novel series starts with Camille having a strange dream and waking up in his bed and suddenly declaring, "I'm going to conquer the world." 
Uh, it was meant to be mysterious and sort of jarring, but at the same time, it was because we didn't really have a plan in advance. So mm-hmm. having that now allowed us to write the beginning of, of the story in a way that was able to foreshadow and we could prioritize, like, what do we want to show here? Like, um, cause I actually did get the comment at a convention. Uh, oh yeah, this is a story that seemed like it wasn't going anywhere. And then it totally does. I was like, Hmm, I hear you. And I appreciate that. It kind of did. I mean, you mentioned adventure time and it kind of reminded me of that. Cause it's just these random things that happen. And then like, where is this going? And then it actually does go somewhere. I was like, Oh, okay. And then they'll sprinkle in more random stuff, but then it is actually connected yeah so, and and i think i think that's what we were trying to do originally is that you don't know it's a po- post-apocalypse until a little bit later but everything st- starts to fall into place and you're like oh okay that's what that was about um so it's it's good when you do it in, intentionally you know but if mm-hmm. you do it accidentally it feels a little mm, maybe i should write that better next time uh-huh so what advice, I guess, could you offer to other creators you wish someone would have told you when you first started? Um, so the, the biggest thing that I say now is don't ask permission to tell your story. Mm-hmm. Um, when we started, we really did want to go to a publisher. We submitted to publishers. We, we really tried and got turned down. And publishers operate a certain way, like they're looking for certain things that will sell and will sell at the volume that they're looking for. And also the way submissions work in the US are sort of discouraging because it's, you blast off a submission packet and possibly never hear from them again. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, the, the most, like, again, the, the best advice that I give now is don't ask permission to write. Write your story tell it in the way that you want and worry about what to do with it later. And it's sort of to say, don't write for other people because you think this is what people like right now, or this will become super popular. And what I'm really after is like the clout or the fame. And, you know, you have to write because you want to write because you have a story to tell. And hopefully from there, you can figure out what to do with it. Uh, (laughs) Because there's not, it's not always an easy answer. Um, I, I think boots on the ground sort of networking at conventions is always good. Um, you know, and if you do go to a convention and you're unknown, don't just sit at the table hoping people come by. Like you have to stand up and talk to people and give them things. Um, because like our first day at a convention was terrible. It was mm-hmm. terrible. We sold like one book maybe. And, you know, if, if it's just two people sitting there with their arms crossed in chairs, like, mm, no, uh, that's not like welcoming, you know? Yeah. Um, and, you know, um, I, for, for when you get to the point of I have something that I want to share, I think there's a, a little bit of almost guerrilla marketing that you can do, but there's a lot of... Um, the people around you try to convince them to support you and then find groups of, of like, like, like-minded people or the indie comics community and chat with them about what was their experience. It's, it's sort of, it's very hard to do alone. And if you just dump something out on the internet, people won't notice. Mm -hmm. That's the most discouraging part about it is if you just throw something out there at random and hope somebody will find it and it'll become popular it, it's just unlikely. It, there's a lot more work behind it than, than it seems. Mm-hmm. So throughout this whole process, maybe when you rebooted it or maybe even in the beginning, somewhere in between, did it ever or do you ever get overwhelmed by it all? Like, does it ever become too much? And how do you typically manage your mental health? Um. Yeah, I I think at the beginning when we were really, like I said, trying to go go to publishers, it was stressful because you're hoping and you're hoping, you know, will somebody like it? Will they pick it up? And eventually, you know, I just started to work on it without the concern about will a publisher buy it? Will I be able to sell a thousand copies of it? 
And I had to just work on it because I had a story that I wanted to get out and I would be satisfied to see it on paper, to see it drawn. And so that was the satisfaction that I was looking for. And it's like finding fulfillment in a hobby. And it, for me, because this isn't my full-time job, this is a hobby and this is something that I want this to exist in the world and I want to put it out there into the world and hope for the best. Um, and of course, you know, because I'm not an artist, that also means that I have to pay an artist to do it and partner with people. Um, and yeah, a little bit of it is that like, it's always been present in the background for me for, for years and years and years. And I'm always working on it in some way, but I also recognize that I'm the one who gets to set the pace of how often it gets worked on or uh, how desperately I need to release something. And um, we did post like a page every other day to our website for a long time. And that created stress around, wow, we don't have pages. Like we have to finish the script. We have to get these drawn. And, you know, that was around the peak of like the web comic thing. And there's less of that now, like they still exist, but I don't hear as much buzz around uh, this. Everybody reads, you know, this one comic that updates Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I think that became the indie comics industry now. And now we have crowdfunding platforms and, and other ways to try to tell your story um, in, a, in a more complete way and also in a more manageable way. Uh, so I guess the short answer for me is that I try to pace it and find a good balance between how much of my time and life am I dedicating just to get this made versus other hobbies that I have or, you know, my day job or, you know, going on vacation um, because there's no guarantees. And mm -hmm. I, I, sometimes we get a, this idea in our head that if I make it, they will come. And I'm like, but, you know, you should make it for the sake of making it because you want to make it and, and hope for the best. But just, you know, try try to temper the expectations a little bit. And that sounds almost sort of downerish, but as you say, like, be realistic. Not everybody can like make a hundred thousand dollars on Kickstarter. And if they if they do, usually it's because they did a lot of networking before, they've established connections, they have like a mailing list or a fan base already, they've done conventions. It's hard work. Yeah. So my last question for you, Chris, is what is your idea of success? So I ask that because as creators, if we're not getting regular paychecks from a full-time job or making consistent revenue from our art, we're considered failures or we'll consider ourselves failures. Many of us will put our dreams and projects on the back burner or give them up altogether because this career path can be highly intimidating and competitive. So what is your idea of quote unquote success? Uh, yeah, this sort of links with the previous question. Um, yeah. We know some professional writers who write for Marvel and DC, and they have like two other jobs because unfortunately I was told this by a couple of different people and I fully believe it now. You don't get into comics to make money. Like you, you do it because you love it. But that also means that the people who are successful, there's more discourse around this now. They're like, look, I, I am on my partner's medical insurance. I, you know, if I make money at conventions, it's to pay my bills. Like it's hard to do comics full time as your only job. And in, in that way, I, um, yeah, success for me would just to be able to make the content that I want to make and find a, find my audience and be able to have them enjoy it and release it to them. And that's more of like the long-term success. The short term is I want to be able to make the thing first and then I'll be happy that I made it. And then I'll go find a way to get it in people's hands. And, um, you know, you can, if you're a writer, your success could be, I love comics and I want to write comics, but ultimately success for me would be to write on television or to get a TV show picked up. And, um, I am also pitching animated series, trying to get those, uh, picked up because comics and animation, you know, they're a little bit go hand in hand. Um, so I think ultimately for me, success would just be to find my audience, find a group of people who enjoy what I'm doing and release it. Okay. So 
Is there anything else that you wanted to touch on about Rapture Burgers that I may have missed as a whole or maybe discuss rewards for potential backers for the Kickstarter? Uh, well, so Rapture Burgers right now for the first volume, uh, we are it, we talk about this a little bit in the Kickstarter, but we're around halfway done with the volume in various different ways. And um, about halfway done with the first volume, Oh, I'm trying to remember what, what I wanted to say here. Uh, we are offering um, digital version, a uh, sort of softback uh, physical version, hardback. And then we have some some extras where you can have a meeting with the team. Uh, you can get commissioned art from Pepper, our, our artist. And, you know, things like uh, posters, stickers, T-shirts, hats, you know, the, the sort of things that you normally offer on a Kickstarter, I think. Okay, that's cool. Well, uh, again, I want to thank the creator, writer, and self-publisher of the Rapture Burgers graphic novel series, Chris Hill, for joining us here today to promote the novel's first volume on Kickstarter. I highly recommend our listeners to consider giving the Kickstarter a look, share, and or back if they can. All of Chris's socials and Kickstarter will be listed in this episode's details for those who are interested. Again, I am K.S. Garner, and you've been listening to the Solo Nerdbook Podcast. Thank you.